Hey, well, welcome to our uh, Ask uh, Questions, Ask Pastor Jack, whatever you would like to call it. It's something that uh, you and I have uh, been experiencing since the the COVID shutdown. And as a ministry, we kind of doubled up all of our efforts on how we could reach you and your family better and more often. And so this entire time, this actual uh, quarter of the year, my goodness, think of it, uh, where as a church we have mobilized and we have flexed and changed with the demands of uh, bringing the word of God to you in all kinds of ways, not only with our youth ministry and children's ministries, uh, but of course with uh, Q&A and with Happening Now, uh, where Don Stewart and I would get together with you or some, some other types of presentations. And this came out of it. Uh, this time of Q&A is something that someone had out there uh, the idea of, hey, you know, we'd like to uh, ask some questions. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. I think this might be, if my memory serves me right, this might be our third time together where it's just you and I. Uh, but uh, we will enjoy ourselves together and, and as a church family. All this, listen, all of this is uh, regarding you and I being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, in fact, it's so great to see that happening again physically here at church, where the Lord, as you well know, I would think that back in April uh, 26th, uh, God made it so clear to me. He gave me May 31st, so crystal clear. I think I told you before, but I wrote it down on a Sharpie pen right on my, my laptop, uh, right into the skin of my laptop, as it were, because it was so profound and uh, as we prayed and fasted and sought the Lord and headed in that direction, it was awesome to obey him and follow him because God, listen, God never leads you astray. God never changes his mind. He never changes direction. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And uh, that's exactly how he communicates to us. And so when we take the time to listen, God speaks. And so we encourage you uh, that in your community, wherever you might be, pray for the, the spiritual leadership of your community. It's vitally important that the church get back to doing what God's called it to do. And let's be honest, everybody, the world is never gonna call the church to do what it's supposed to do. A lot of people are messed up in their logic right now thinking that the church has gotta get permission from the world to do its business for God. That's one of the most prevailing, prevalent lies of Satan today, right now, is that, for example, and this shouldn't surprise any of us, the, the issue of marriage and what is the definition of marriage? Well, the world told us what it is, not God. Don't listen to God anymore. And you churches, you don't know anything. And don't bother us with your silly Bible. No, we're gonna tell you what the definition of marriage is now. And then the world comes along and says, nope, this is what we think is the best thing to do, is that a woman should have a right to choose even up to the birth of the baby. And then if she chooses that baby or selects that baby to die, that baby is to die. Don't bother us, ministry, church, Bible people with that kind of stuff because we're gonna tell you what life is and its value. And so now the world, and I hope people can see this, the world comes along and takes advantage. Satan comes along, takes advantage of situations and says, oh, listen, the church now needs to listen to the uh, carnal, the godless entities of, of our nation or of our state uh, for the church to do what it's uh, to do. We'll tell you when and how. And I hope people are waking up to the realization of the demonic plot that that really is all about. If you know church history, if you've studied it, and if you've looked at recent church history, uh, World War II era, for example, with Adolf Hitler in the Lutheran church, and, and then what spread to the other uh, denominations throughout Europe, uh, what Satan did through politics. Look, Satan doesn't have a pulpit. Satan uses the realm of politics to manipulate people. And so it's exactly what's happening today. And uh, thank God, we know our Lord Jesus Christ. We know what the Bible says. And so we're sticking to that. So um, it's always safe to be with people uh, or with, with the people of God and with God rather than the people of this world in opinion. 
because opinion will lead you astray every time. So um, listen, I've stalled long enough. Before we get into the questions tonight, we want to remind you that you can always stay in touch with us. You can go to YouTube and uh, type in Jack Hibbs, or I think it's Real Life with Jack Hibbs at YouTube, something like that. And you can go there and do us a great favor. It really helps us a lot. If you simply subscribe, just subscribe. Click the button, subscribe. And that, that is a great encouragement. If any of you want to encourage me, <laughs> that's how you would do it from afar, is click subscribe. Uh, you can certainly uh, be on my Facebook page where many of you are viewing this right now, Facebook Live, uh, at Pastor Jack or realjackhibbs.com com or dot org or whatever it is at Facebook. And then of course the church's website, which is now uh, Facebook streaming to you or live streaming to you as well. There's various platforms. We encourage you to stay uh, in touch with us. And um, so with that, we are going to go to, I have, I'm going to be looking up at a screen that's just above the camera. So that's why I'm looking up. If you're wondering why this is Joe in Oklahoma. So Joe, um, are you there? Can I hear you? Listen, if you can hear me, Joe, can you ask me your question? Yes. First, I want to say uh, I appreciate your courage and your boldness for stand up in these oh. chaotic times we have. You're kind. Yeah. You, Joe, you pray. Right, my question is. You pray and I'll stand. Yes. Pardon? You just pray and I'll take a stand and we'll do it together. All right. Sounds good. All right. My question is. Uh, do you think that because of the Ezekiel 38 war, the nations around Israel will be so scared after the victory that they'll be willing to let Israel do whatever she wants, including building the temple? You know, um, that is a good question. I, I don't know regarding the victory that Israel is going to have regarding the Ezekiel battle is that going to let, because of fear, the other nations surrounding, is that going to be the reason, Joe, that they allow the temple to rebuild? How about this, Joe? Is, it's possibly this. We know from Ezekiel 38 that there appears to be no reference to the temple existing at all. It doesn't mean it doesn't, it just, but it doesn't mean it does. There's no reference, Joe, to the, Ezek to the right. temple existing in, in uh, chapter 38. However, a lot of great scholars, and when I say great scholars, I'm talking about uh, some of the ones that have gone way before us, Dr. John Wolverine, Dr. Uh, Harry Ironside, Clarence Larkin, uh, Dwight Pentecost, uh, some of those excellent scholars, they actually put this forward, Joe, and this is a really good way to entertain that question of yours. What do we do know? We know that Russia, with its surrounding coalition of, of a handful of nations, mind you, this is not Armageddon, Ezekiel 38's a different battle. This is, this is a handful of nations, they're all Muslim, and they come against Israel. But the Bible says, Joe, in Ezekiel 38, that when God intervenes, Israel's gonna know that God did it. Now, that's a tremendous statement. What does that mean? Does that mean all of Israel? Does it mean some begin to wake up? I personally believe that the remnant will begin to wake up, that God has helped us, maybe a spiritual awakening. Having said that, the Ezekiel battle uh, is debated, you know, Joe. Is, could it happen at any moment? Right. Or does it have to happen, uh, you know, right before the tribulation period? Why do people speculate? Because uh, Israel will not be at peace as long as its neighbors are coming against it. The Ezekiel battle takes care of those neighbors. But it also might open up the door, Joe, for the Antichrist to come in and sign a peace treaty basically saying, okay, we don't want that to ever happen again, do we? So sign this peace treaty with your neighbors so that they never act, act up like that again. And uh, by the way, you can go ahead and rebuild your temple. The reason why I put that forward to you, Joe, is because Syria, remember Syria is not mentioned in those nations. I think Syria, Damascus specifically, Damascus, I think Damascus is going to be obliterated somehow, some way before Ezekiel 38. But you ask a very, very smart question. Could it be that Israel feels so secure and so, so strong after the Ezekiel battle 
that their neighbors say, go ahead and build your temple, possible, I think it's that they're gonna realize some, I should say, some Jews are gonna start waking up to God's hand while others will be deceived by the advent of the Antichrist. There's no doubt about it. 2 Thessalonians 2 lets us know that when the Antichrist does show up, there is a temple that he announces himself to the world as being God. So amazing things, Joe. We're gonna have to watch and see what happens. But that's a very insightful question. That's a good one. Do we have another question? Right. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, Edgar from Chino Hills. Not too, not too far away, Edgar. Yes, how you doing, Pastor? God bless. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, Edgar. Um, what question do you have? Yes, I know we talked about this last Sunday. Uh, I, went to, I went to church this Sunday. Uh, I know we talked about it. I know that the, uh, the rapture comes before tribulation. Yes. Uh, uh, can we actually, at this time and age, can we actually depict, or at least, are we, can we tell, are we at the sign, where, are we at that time, where, where, where oh, the sign of age, that we're on that, yes, you can mean, we actually depict it? Edgar, if I can hear you right, are you asking, can we, can, we, uh, f- can we confidently believe that we're in the time of when the rapture could happen? Is that what you meant, is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. Oh my, okay, I got you yes. loud and clear now. Yes, of course, absolutely, because uh, I think the scripture is very clear, Edgar, that uh, as we mentioned on Sunday's service, that there is no prerequisite Bible prophecies before the rapture can happen. The rapture is that fundamental teaching of both Jesus and the apostles that is something that is known as a mystery, like the church is known as a mystery that it is something, mysterion is the Greek word, and it means it's not that it's a mystery you can't know. It means it's a mystery that's been revealed until the right time. So the church is a mystery. For example, Israel in the Old Testament didn't understand the church or the place of the church, but God knew there would be a time for the church, and the Bible made accounts for that. Regarding the rapture, it is a biblical event referred to in Scripture. What makes it a mystery is the fact that it is something that will happen. It has no warning signs before it happens. So what does it mean? Edgar, it means every day that we're further down the prophetic road, we're one day closer to that moment of the rapture. And that's why the rapture teaching is always one to focus on getting ready. Uh, 1 John Read 1 John, especially chapter 2 and 3. It tells you there that we as believers, if we are looking for the return of Jesus, it's going to cause us to stand straight, so to speak, morally, and we are going to be worshipers. We're going to be busy about our Father's business. We are, going to be, we are going to be touched by the fact that he could come at any time. Now, Edgar, between you and I, I am actually expecting mm-hmm. Jesus any day. And if he doesn't come for three weeks, I'm going to keep expecting <laughs> him. And if he doesn't come for three months, I'm still going to expect him. But the fact of the matter is, we are living at a time, like I mentioned on Sunday, first time in history where we've got global issues affecting everyone, including the church, at the exact same time. The only thing that ever came close to this before was like World War II for example, but that that didn't affect the entire world, nor did it affect the church. But for example, the COVID uh, pandemic, that affected the entire globe and the church. Well, now we've got uh, uh, violent, rioting, you know, in America, I'm standing in America right now, uh, protest is fine, but rioting is illegal. And But yet around the world now, there's starting to be an outbreak of violent Uh, rioting. What's going on? Well, these are things that tell me, number one, this earth's not my home, thank God. And the other thing is, wow, Mm -hmm. since, since Israel has been existing as a nation, here's the church at the same time that Israel exists. I know you're coming back, Lord, for the church at any time because you're about ready to work with Israel again in the last days. So, wow, I'm ready now, Jesus. I'm ready now. And I think God wants us to live, Edgar, in that mindset of let's be ready for him now. That's, that's what I think. So. Okay. Listen, brother, God well, bless Pastor, you. Yes. Uh, hopefully someday will you meet me in heaven? 
<laughs> well, let me ask you, Edgar, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord? Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again from the dead? Well, Pastor Jack, funny you mentioned that. I was born again in your church. Since then on, I've been coming in. Well, brother, listen, if you so, put your uh, faith in Je if you put your faith in <laughs> Jesus, Edgar, you and I are going to go up together. And we'll and we'll have an awesome time oh. in heaven together. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, hopefully I'll meet you there sometime. <laughs> well, hey, listen. <laughs> Thank I, you, Pastor Jack. I'll, I'll definitely see you in heaven. All right, brother. We'll see you. Okay. <laughs> thank this you. Is, thank you. Uh, this is Ashley from Hawaii. Hawaii. I mean, Ashley, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Hi, Ashley. What, uh, what's your question? Yes, thank you so much for everything. Uh, okay, so my question is this. Um, I previously had believed in a uh, the rapture to happen pre-trib, but if I just read the scripture, and I'm, I'm no one special, but if I read Matthew, First and Second Thessalonians, Revelation, um, just reading it at face value, I don't see the rapture occurring pre-trib. So I was just wondering if you could guide me in while in why you and so many other uh, wonderful yes. pastors do adhere to a yeah. uh, the rapture happening pre-tribulation. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. Ashley, hopefully you can write these references down. If not, I'm sure yeah. if not, you can go back and review this broadcast. I'm sure you can. So Ashley, you mentioned um, the Gospels, specific, specifically Matthew. You mentioned Revelation. Um, and you mentioned some of the epistles. And you mentioned them in, uh, in the... the a scenario where you don't, you don't see a pre-tribulation rapture. So here's what I want you to write down. Ask yourself this. Okay. Ask yourself this question. What is the tribulation period for? What's it for? Okay, you want to ask yourself that. You know, so find out what's it for. Okay, how does the Bible describe the tribulation period? Okay, you want to ask yourself those questions. And you want to ask yourself the question is, uh, is anyone, is anything exempt from the tribulation period. In other words, mark this down now. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, there is literally a specific reference in each of the chapters to the church of Thessalonica that God has uh, predetermined, destined, uh, programmed, um, announced that the church will not see the wrath of God that it has escaped the wrath that's coming. And that's exactly the word that it uses in Scripture. Five chapters, five promises in 1 Thessalonians chapters 1 through 5. What I want you to do, because I don't want you to change your mind because I say anything to you. I want you to change your mind because God is speaking to you. So look up the word wrath. Look it up and see what it means. This is the, one of the most wonderful things, Ashley, for you to look at. What does the word wrath mean? Okay, so you go do that. And then you mentioned Matthew. And I think, you, did you mean Matthew 24 maybe? Yes. Perfect. Are you, get ready to write this down. Here's a shocker. Ready? Matthew 24, yes. Luke 21, Mark 13 has nothing to do <clears throat> at all with Gentiles. Sorry, I'm choking on something. <clears throat> Those chapters have nothing to do <clears throat> with the church. And I'm, I'm going to try to provoke you to, <clears throat> to think something now. If you read Matthew 24, you're going to be reading along. By the way, uh, again, uh, Luke 21 and... Uh, Mark 13, the same thing, Ashley. So as you're reading, so you got Matthew, you got Mark, and you got Luke's picture of the same teaching of Jesus, okay? So you've got things like this. When G uh, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the place where it should not, come down from your housetop. Ashley, do you live on top of your house? No. No. Keep reading. And when you come down from your house, don't even go uh, to, don't go take anything. Run. And if you're in the field plowing, don't even go back to get your jacket. Run. And 
he gives you this breakdown. And then he says right there in the middle, and pray that your escape, that, you, that when you run, it's not on a Sabbath day or uh, in the snow, a Jerusalem. Uh, it snows in Jerusalem every year. Read that in Matthew, Luke, and Mark. He says, pray that it's not on a winter day. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath. Don't leave so fast. Don't even go into your house to get your jacket. Listen, Ashley, ask yourself these questions. Where are they going? Where did he tell them to go? And that's funny. I don't live, you know, I don't live on top of my roof. I don't live near Jerusalem. I don't care about the Sabbath because Ashley, Matthew 24 in the tribulation period is all about Israel in the world at that time. Jesus is addressing the future uh, Jews who believe in Jesus at that time. The tribulation period is the fulfillment of Daniel chapter nine, verses 24 to 27. God owes is Israel seven years of specific focus that he's promised to them back in Daniel nine. And so, um, the church cannot be the recipient of God's wrath because it tells you that the world receives the wrath of God. In fact, Israel doesn't even receive the wrath of God during the tribulation period. It is a Jewish event. That's why in Revelation 4, Ashley, verse 1, John, who's a member of the church, is from chapter 4, verse 1, he's in heaven from that moment on forevermore. John's not telling you what's happening on earth where he's at on earth. He's not on earth. John is not saying, oh my goodness, and the church was destroyed at, at, the, at the midpoint of the tribulation or at this point. The church was crushed and Christians were killed. He doesn't say that. The church is seen, Ashley, in Revelation 4, Revelation 2, 3, and represented in chapter 4, verse 1, and then it's never seen again, Ashley, except in Revelation 19 in heaven, it's up there. You gotta ask yourself this question. How did she get there? How did the church get to heaven like that? When did that happen? John chapter 14, verses one, two, and three tells you, and so does 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. So it's a fundamental, it's a fundamental understanding of this, Ashley. Wrath is God's indignation, God's punishment, brought down against a Christ-rejecting world during the seven-year tribulation period. God's focusing on the Jewish nation because he owes them seven years of special dispensation that he talked about in chapter nine of Daniel. Very important. Has nothing to do with the church because actually Jesus took the wrath for you and me at the cross. He was punished for us. You say, well, Jack, what about the saints that died during the tribulation period? Because it says that they're beheaded. You are correct. Those are tribulation believers. They're not members of the church. And the Bible's very clear that they're not members of the church because you see them in heaven after they're beheaded. The Bible says that they're under the altar of God waiting for their other brethren to be killed as they were, but when you read about them in the book of Revelation, they're nowhere near the church. The church is actually watching them and they are entering into heaven during the tribulation period, but they're, but they're the tribulation saints. They wear robes. The church in heaven wears fine white linen, the Bible says, clean and bright. So Ashley, I'm gonna leave you with this. Get a book, it is awesome. It's fantastic. It's called The Rapture Question by Dr. John Wolverd. The Rapture Question. Here's the reason why it's so great. Dr. John Wolverd was so skilled at Bible prophecy that he argues each of the different views perfectly from their perspective. He's gonna give you the arguments from every angle. Pre, mid, post, trib, pre, wrath, midpoint, trib. He gives it all. And he even talks about who gets raptured. Do, do super Christians get raptured, but not so good Christians get raptured? He's gonna answer that and so much more. It's called The Rapture Question by Dr. John Wolford. Ashley, get that book. Promise me you'll get it and read it because it will blow your mind. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. And, oh, yes, we're ready for the Lord's return Amen. immediately. Amen. So thank you. God bless you, Ashley. Uh, Monterey, and this is a call coming in from Utah. And are you there? I am. I can hear you. Awesome. Hi, Pastor Hi. Jack. How, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm very good. I'm good. What's your question? Good. So I, I just realized I haven't been tuning in because I've been on my phone. Um, so I don't know if this is a good question or not, or if someone's <laughs> already asked it. But and I'm just wondering if the church will see any of the pre-tribulation, like the turmoil that's going to happen in the tribulation period, if we're going to see any of that before the rapture. And I know that the world's already lost its mind. And right. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. everyone's already delusional. Um, yeah. <laughs> But I just don't know, like, if we're, do you, it could be an opinion thing. No, listen, actually, um, I know to you it might feel like an opinion thing, but it's actually a very, very serious theological term. The question you just asked really goes deep, to be honest with you. So it's an awesome question. So here's the, in fact, it kind of goes along with the call that we had a little bit earlier. Keep this in mind. The seven years are, are promised to Israel. Those seven years of tribulation, that's a time that God has promised that he would be dealing with Israel. Now, let's remember this, everybody. She's, she's asking a great question. The tribulation period is seven years. It's divided into two segments, says God. 42 months, 42 months. Or 1,260 days, and 1,260 days. Now you say, Jack, those numbers are weird. No, they're not. The Bible has 360 day years, not 365, yeah. 360. So keep this in mind. Yeah, for sure. Even though the seven years is divided into two different uh, plays or, or uh, episodes, let's call it that. There's no way that the church bleeds in or steps the line over into the tribulation period because, again, theologically, it is specifically dealing, God dealing with Israel. The Bible tells us that what starts the tribulation period, Monterey, is that the book of Thessalonians tells us that the Antichrist signs a treaty, signs a deal, a covenant with okay, Israel. Yeah. Daniel 9 and read 2 Thessalonians and actually read 1st and 2nd okay. Thessalonians both because those two books of course will give you a, a more full and round picture. But here's what you're going to see. The 7 years is what Israel owes to God because God has promised to focus on Israel at the end for 7 years. That seven years has no mention of the church in it at all. Zero. Okay. In fact, okay. the church has to be gone before the Antichrist is revealed because we know that when he's revealed, the scripture says in 2 Thessalonians that he's going to sign that treaty with Israel, but, can, but it can only happen after the hinderer, the Holy Spirit, steps aside and it says, and then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. And I believe that's a, that's a clear reference to the Holy Spirit yielding up the church to Christ in the atmosphere. The Holy Spirit steps aside and evil is released like we've never seen before. And in that, the Bible says that Antichrist is revealed. He's gonna come into the world and the church is the actual entity right now that the Holy Spirit is using uh, to, to hold back evil. Imagine, Monterey, if the church, if the evil that we're say, seeing right now, you mentioned, you said something to the effect that the church has gone mad, or the world has gone mad, the world has gone crazy. Can you imagine? This mm -hmm. is nothing. This is nothing. Oh, and that's, compared that's to what's my thing. Is that it's like, it's, go, it's getting so crazy already. I yeah. just don't know how far it's going to get before the rapture. I mean, would you yeah. say that this strong delusion has already, already hit a good portion of the world? No, gosh, no. No, no, no. Because okay. listen, here's, it's very clear. Again, you're going, you go back to Second Thessalonians. The strong delusion cannot happen until the church is removed. And then the scripture okay. says, then God will send those who refuse to believe. 
He will send those okay. who refuse to believe strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. And the lie is that which is yes. going to come from the Antichrist. You'll be out of here okay. before that strong delusion hits. But I got to tell you, Monterey, I, I'm with you. When I look around, when I look around and I see all of a sudden in the last five months, what people are thinking how they're thinking. I have never, never, never. I've felt so detached from the close people in my life than I don't. You know, it's mind boggling. Listen, I want you to, I know that hurts and I, I got that. I see it too. But know this, everything's starting to be shaken right now. And people who are on the edge, they're going to have to decide if their faith is real or not. <laughs> Right now, people, uh -huh. there's people who are looking around like us and we're saying, wow, this is very, very unpleasant. Man, Jesus talked about times like this coming. Now, this is not the fulfillment of it all, but it's starting. And man, the Lord's yeah. coming must be close. Wow, his return must be close because this is crazy. Oh, it has to be. And you look at people's Absolutely. logic. People are terrified. They gave up on faith. If, you know, they're, oh. they're mortified and they believe a lie. Somebody says something on TV or somebody tweets something. And they believe it. That's all it takes. It's yep. crazy. No, nah, it's crazy. I'm with it you, is. but uh, it's, it's nothing compared to what's coming. But can the church yeah. go up at any moment? Oh, yes. Amen. That's what Absolutely. I'm living for. Amen. Okay. Well, I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Pastor Jack. Appreciate you. Thank you. God bless you. This, uh, this next call is Courtney from Virginia. Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Are you there? Hi. Awesome. Hi, Pastor Jack. Great. Hi. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for taking my call. It's my pleasure. What, what's your question for today? My question is, as I've been thinking about what's going on in the United States right now, my prayer is that um, the United States is a sheep nation. That's what I've been praying, that, that God would, that we would be a sheep nation when Jesus comes back to judge the nations um, during the tribulation that we took care of the Jews in some way. And then he reminded me of Ezekiel 38, 13. And I just wondered about the Sheba Didan and the young lions of Tarshish, if that is indeed an um, indicator in that that's the United States. Um, would that possibly be an indicator that we might be a sheep nation if we're looking at the Bible? Um, yeah. I know we can't be dogmatic about it, but that's what um, right. the Holy Spirit reminded me of that verse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a really great question. Number one, um, what I want you to be careful about, Ezekiel 38 battle. Ezekiel 38 battle, battle is not Armageddon. It's not the same. Our, uh, Ezekiel 38 encompasses R Russia, uh, Libya. You see the nations listed there. Uh, uh, Gomer, uh, to uh, Turkey, Togomar, uh, those nations. It talks about Libya. Uh, those nations mentioned there, Courtney, um, are just a handful of Muslim nations today. And what's interesting, Persia as well. So, when you talk about the second coming of Jesus, right? Because you talked about sheep nations. Did I hear you correctly? Like sheep and goats? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. Watch this. You take Ezekiel 38 and you put it right over here. You set it off to the side, okay? Regarding your question about being a sheep or goat nation, you're referring to Matthew chapter 25. And that's very important. Matthew chapter 25 happens after Matthew chapter 24. And what's so important about that? Matthew chapter 24, Jesus mentions the advent of the Antichrist, the events that happen when he shows himself to Israel, and they flee away, and there's massive global upheavals, there's global pestilence, there's global earthquakes, there's global fear, there is global wars and rumors of wars. There's all of these things happening. And then watch this. And by the way, when you look at Matthew 25, you're going to want to read Revelation 17, 18, 19, for sure, as it overlays that, okay? And watch this. Revelation 19 opens up with Jesus coming back to earth in what is called the second coming. And when he returns in the second coming, his foot will touch the Mount of Olives. It's going to split open. 
He's gonna continue down. He's gonna go through the, the Eastern or the Golden Gate in Jerusalem. He has to, Bible says so. And then he's gonna sit upon the throne of David. And this is what you're referring to. And he's gonna judge the nations of the world. Courtney, don't forget this, write this down. He's gonna sit on, the, on David's throne. This is awesome. Because Jesus has never sat on David's throne before. He has to sit on the throne of David, which is in Jerusalem. Jesus is on a throne now in heaven, but it's not David's throne. David's throne's on earth. Jesus has to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And watch this. Go read Daniel chapter 12. Why? It's going to tell you that when he comes back, he's going to set up his kingdom. And it tells you that he's going to judge the nations. Now back to Matthew 25. He's going to separate the nations, that is the nations during the tribulation period, the people of the nations. It's not just a nation. Let's, I'm going to make this up right now. It's not just Canada that he's going to deal with. He's going to deal with an individual, nation, the individual, the Gentile. How did the Gentile treat the Jews during the tribulation period? At the time of Christ's second coming, He's going to put an end to the horrific antics of that last few moments. Remember what he said? If he didn't return, there would be no flesh left on earth. Wow. He's going to stop it all. He's going to destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet. And he's going to cast them and Satan into the lake of fire. And he's going to establish his throne. That judgment period, he's going to separate the nations, the sheep from the goats. And that will be Gentile nations being judged as sheep if they were kind to Israel. You can read it, Matthew 24, because their reward is that they get to live into the millennial kingdom. They get to live into the restored earth and, to, and, the, re, and the restored environment that Jesus establishes on his, uh, on his father's throne, David. The goats are taken away and thrown what we think we believe Sounds like anyway from Ezekiel and Isaiah and the book of Revelation, it's, it looks like they are cast over to Gehenna, uh, the Valley of Hinnom or the Valley of Gehenna. And that is the southwestern tip of Mount Moriah in Jerusalem today. And that is the place that where Judas, for example, hung himself. It's the place where no Jews will go because it's believed to be cursed. Um, it's a reference of hell during ancient times. They called it Hades itself because it was so bad. So uh, Ezekiel battle, that's one thing. I think the Ezekiel battle is, uh, could happen at any time, but the second coming cannot happen until the battle of Armageddon plays out and Jesus in Revelation 19 interrupts that. So uh, really insightful question, Courtney. That's a great question. So God bless you. That's a great question. My goodness. So David from Florida. My goodness. I love all these questions coming in from all over the States. David, are you there? Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what question do you have? Okay. My question is uh, Matthew sixteen nineteen. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I I just don't understand that. Well, first of all, let's let's address the the issue of the keys. First of all, uh, remember, before Jesus ascended to heaven, he he announced to Peter that he had the keys. Remember, Peter had the keys. Yes, (laughs) yes. Okay, and then that's that's been... yeah. yeah, that's been the church age, and Peter has had the keys. The beautiful thing about that is when the book of Revelation was revealed, given to John in, in the year 95 AD, Peter doesn't have the keys anymore. The Bible tells us in the seven letters of the seven churches that Jesus holds the keys. So I don't know if Peter, uh-huh. I don't know if Peter fell over a rock and tripped and lost the keys or what, but Jesus has got him now. Uh, <laughs> but getting back to the question, though, of, of loosening and binding, this is what we understand, David, what that means. It's the, it's the authority of a, a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. We walk in that authority of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit resides in us 
And that authority is native to the Christian. Let me tell you what I mean by that. It's that authority that allows you and I, David, as believers uh, to witness to somebody, for example. If, if we share Christ with somebody and they say, nope, I don't want him, I don't want anything to do with him, leave me alone, we have the authority to say to them, then, my dear friend, I'm sorry to say to you that you still, you still live in sin. The judgment of God is still upon you and it will be that way unless you repent and follow Jesus. The Bible tells us in the same token, David, that if somebody says, I repent of my sin and I put my faith in Jesus Christ, then the, uh, 1 John tells us that we have the authority to say to them, then you are loosed from your sins. You're, you're made new in Christ and you've become a new creation. God bless you. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God bless you, brother. I'll see you in heaven. That's the authority of the believer. So when it comes to loosening and binding, what does it mean? It means, for example, if I am praying something in accordance to the will of God, or if I'm doing something that's in accordance with the will of God, then the authority of heaven supports the action that I'm taking. Why? It's not mine, it's his. And the same thing is true when it, when it talks about um, when we bind or loose. We are bringing the authority of God into something to where we are, we are taking this for the kingdom of God. His word is clear on this and we wage war against the enemy that way. Um, it's, it has nothing to do, David, with us claiming, I'm, I'm loosening, you know, I'm loosening a million dollars to myself, so, so you know, bring the million dollars, God. I, no, 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 it doesn't, and, and I bind, yeah. <laughs> you know, I bind this uh, uh, because, you know, God promised me a, a Ferrari, and I, no, 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 no. It's standing in the authority of God's word, live in your life in that authority that's biblically based, where you have that commissioning from the Holy Spirit in your life. Uh, I, wish more, I wish more believers recognized the authority that God has given us. Great, great. Yeah, I thank you so much, Pastor Jack. You are doing such a wonderful job, and we love you. Oh. We love your church. And we're, we just hope to get there someday. But the next time we have a conference, uh, I, I, I always see you on uh, whatever's going on, yeah. uh, you know, when you're at a conference. But thank you so much. God thank, bless you. Thank you, David. Please pray for us. Thank you. Okay, this is great. We have Phyllis from Ontario, Canada. So Phyllis from Ontario, Canada, are you there? Hi, Pastor. Hi, how are you, Phyllis? Can, I'm fine, thank you. I hope you're, you and your family are well. Yes, we're well. Thank you so much. What, what questions Good. do you have? Good. Yeah. Well, okay, um... Because of all the chaos and lawlessness today, can Satan and his demons put thoughts in our head or put thoughts in people or move things around or, oh, yeah. you know, oh. I don't know. I know that they can't be everywhere at once. <laughs> Thank God, right? This is true. Satan, yeah, is, really, a, right? Satan is a created being. He's limited. He's not, he's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He's not all powerful. He's not everywhere. That's why he has a demon legion. He's got a group of demonic spirits that do his bidding. We know that there's fallen angels that do his bidding. Um, so her question, you're, it's a great, great question. And I think, I think, Phyllis, a lot of people are asking this question. You know, what's going on in the world and is Satan behind it? Um, number one, Satan can shoot thoughts into your head. Absolutely. The Bible tells us, for example, in the first Corinthians, that you and I need to bring every thought under the captivity of Christ. So a thought enters our mind. We start to wrestle with it. We need to rebuke that thought and just give it to Jesus. Okay, no matter what it is. Listen, if it goes against the word of God, you grab that thought and you say, this doesn't align with God's word. I'm not going to entertain that thought in my life. And I'm going to throw it throw it over to the Lord. That's, that's not for me. It's not, it's not for me to deal with. Now, number one, Phyllis, you got to know the Bible before you can do that. Uh, the second thing is we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual hosts of wickedness in, in very dark, sinister places. Phyllis, you and I wage war 
in the spiritual realm. How do we do that? When we pray, when we worship, when we, when we serve, when we give, when we love, we are acting out what God's will is for us and the enemy forces don't want that. And their area of battle is your mind, Phyllis, my mind, your mind, all the believers and even the non-believers, they shoot what they want done into the minds of people. This is demonic activity. So for example, you talked about how crazy the world is. I believe that's exactly what's going on. I believe by the level of fear that's in the world, I believe how sad this is. I believe that people who were once strong and, and they, they followed God unwaveringly, now they're timid, scared, frightened, uh, uh, losing courage. They don't know what to do uh, because they're hearing voices. I don't mean they're hearing voices. They're listening to, to things that are being said by people, people they don't even know perhaps. What's happening? The enemy is sowing thoughts into people's minds and no one's exempt from this. But we as believers know how to destroy those thoughts with the word of God. See, the world out there right now doesn't have the word. So Satan is sh shooting thoughts into the culture all around the world right now to think a certain way, to do a certain thing. And they don't have any way of refuting him. To them, it's a lying, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a convincing lie. But to the believer, you go, wait a minute. That's not right. And how do you know it's not right? Because the word of God has taught you that. And so you fight. So yeah, Phyllis, this is a bizarre time. I think we're seeing demonic activity starting to manifest itself in the world around us. And fear, remember, confusion, fear, intimidation, uh, lying. All of these things are indicators of satanic fingerprints in the mix. So I hope that helps. We're gonna take a call from Paul and Chino. So just down the road to my right. So Paul, are you there? Yes, yeah, this is Paul. Hi, Paul. Yes. Hi, Pastor Jack. This is Paul from Chino. Excellent. God bless you. God bless you, Paul. What question thank do you, you have? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this, it's kind of a loaded question, but it has to do with um, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 16. For the believer, we wait for that blessed hope and appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But it's, it's, a, it's a loaded question, but um, I, I've heard you say before, tell me the bad news first. Yes. And so it, it's, kind of, it's kind of both. And so for the believer, we're going to be up in heaven, of course. So I guess my question would be, if, if you could give us an abstract picture to the audience of what, what it would be like in heaven— immediately right after the rapture, and then, of course, the utter um, catastrophe that, that the earth is here, you know, with, with the unbelievers that don't go up. You know, I, I think of a surgeon who's not at the operating table no more, or, or a, a pilot who's no longer in the cockpit, <laughs> and so right. there's a tremendous amount of disaster that I think that'll happen immediately, so my question is, is a snapshot of immediately right after the rapture here on earth and then us in heaven. Wow. Well, it's an awesome question. And you know, Paul, that I can only speculate uh, on most of it, but the, let's go with what we know for sure first, okay? What we know for sure first and absolutely is that the Bible says to be absent from this physical body is to be present with the Lord. Now, that means the moment a believer dies, they, go, they open their eyes and they're with Jesus. But before we describe that, the rapture interrupts that. It doesn't contradict that verse. It interrupts that verse. You see, what do you mean? Well, right now, when we die, the believer goes straight to Jesus, but we have your funeral and we put you in the ground and we wait for the resurrection or the rapture of the church. The church will be raptured, the dead in Christ will rise. So we want to be very clear about that. If you die today, you go immediately with the Lord. If the rapture happens today, you don't die, you go immediately to be with the Lord. It's a wonderful bonus, right? So what happens? Wow. Well, I, on earth, I would assume, I sure hope so, 
that there's gonna be a whole lot of people raptured, that it is somehow, now watch this, you gotta play this out because we speculate that it's somehow, what, noticeable that these people are missing? How's that gonna be explained away? Um, people are gonna be missing and people are gonna put two and two together and they're gonna say, well, it's funny, these people with, that are missing, they all had Bibles in their houses or these people all had Christian stickers on their cars or skateboards, I don't know. But what's the connection? Why is it Christians they're gone? What happened here? Or the Christians are raptured and instantly there's a demonic delusion or what if at the, at the same time the rapture happens, a moment afterwards, what if the explanation, Paul, is that the world says, oh my goodness, you know what? We saw a bunch of UFOs and it was very strange. There was this weird light in the air and whatever, who knows what. And oh, that's what must have happened to all these people. I don't know. We don't know. But somehow the world is going to be duped. But not only that, there could be devastating things that follow. For example, imagine in the United States right now, in our government. I know several born-again believers in the president's cabinet. Imagine if they're gone. Imagine, for example, if what Vice President Mike Pence says is true, that there are more Bible studies and prayer meetings taking place right now in this administration than any other time in recorded American history. What if they're all raptured? Where does that leave America? I don't know. What about those airplanes or cars on the roadway like the movie Left Behind portrayed? I don't know. Let's leave that alone because the Bible doesn't say. You mentioned heaven. What's, what's the opening moments going to be like? The only thing I can say from Scripture is based on these few events. And maybe, the, maybe you'll want to look at them. Number one, book of Acts, chapter 7. Stephen is stoned to death, right? They kill him. But as he's dying, he sees heaven open and he sees Jesus standing. He stands up to welcome Stephen into heaven. And Stephen mentions the glory of God. I see the glory of God. So we're gonna see glory. Number two, we know that when John was taken up in Revelation 4, 1, he sees heaven. And you want to read Revelation 4 and 5, chapters 4 and 5. He tells you what he's looking at. It's awesome. John is our prototype, so to speak. He's our forerunner. John gets up there, and he's looking, and he's describing a lamb sitting on a throne. And it looks as though he's been slain, a lamb. He's, he looks like he's been slain, and he... he the, the, the angels are there, and the elders are there, and he describes it. Paul. He describes what he sees in the opening moments of heaven when he sees it. And John is blown away. And so when people, listen, when people die here at the church, I tell their families, from now until you meet them again, if you want to have a little bit of a connection, read Revelation 4 and 5. Because it describes what John first saw. It, Acts 7 describes what Stephen saw, and then again, also in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, Paul the Apostle talks about himself in the third person. He says, I know a man who, about 14 years ago, he was, left, he was killed and left for dead, and he saw things in heaven that were unspeakable, so fantastic that it's not right for anyone to even express in human words the glory that was there. So we can speculate, we can think, but best thing to do is go to those areas of the Bible that describe what Ezekiel saw, what Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 he tells us about, what John, that's what I would do, but I think, um, I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's just in the human nature, the way God made us. Paul, I think you and I are going to walk around the first few moments, or I don't know, first couple of years, just absolutely freaking out uh, like John did. I think John freaked out. I think it's just amazing. And, um, you know, this earth is going to be left in upheaval, no doubt. 
so much so that the Antichrist will somehow bring peace and stability after the church is raptured. Uh, the world's going to need it, and apparently he's the guy that brings the answer to the people. So God bless you, Paul. I, just, I pray the Lord's blessing on your life, brother. This is uh, Jill from Minnesota. Jill, how are you? Hi. Hi. I'm doing well. Thank you for taking my question. It relates to deception in the church and of believers as a sign of yep. the end times. And I was wondering if you um, are seeing like particular um, lies that Christians are believing today, or if there are particular lies you feel like Christians are maybe vulnerable to believing and um, how can we kind of protect ourselves to make sure that we're believing only what is true? Yeah, first, a great question. First of all, um, deception has always been. We all agree on that. The Bible warns about it, tells us about it. And in fact, the Bible reveals to us the real issues about deception. And it starts off in Genesis chapter three. We, we get baptized into the art of deception by Satan himself. All the way through the Bible, the Bible reveals to us the acts and antics of deception. And by the time we come to the end of the Old Testament, deception knows no bounds. Deception is off the charts. But the light is not clearly lit for us until the New Testament reveals to us uh, the scripture. Why? It's the scripture that takes us with power into the world of deception. And we get to discern. So Jill, the key word, what you're talking about is discernment. What happens in, in, in the church or Christian's life when we have discernment? Discernment is the Holy Spirit's working in our lives and it's also a gift re referred to in the Bible as a gift of the Holy Spirit where the word of God is used as the plumb line, Jill. It is the, take that ribbon hanging straight down. Gravity's pulling that ribbon straight like that. It's a plumb line. Think about that. Discernment is the plumb line between the truth of God and what you and I observe. And so when we look around this world, what's happening? We are watching people who now has caused, it's caused us to wonder, is my friend even a Christian anymore? What in the world is he saying? Why is he doing that? Where did he get that from? And he, he watch my fingers now, air quotes. He used to be a believer, uh, but, but now with certain things going on in the world around him, he's completely departed from scripture and he's gone down some other path, deception. Or your friend had the joy of the Lord and then COVID hit or whatever and that person's faith went out the window. No more joy, no faith, no trust in God, completely bound up by fear, crippled and debilitated. In fact, their faith is gone. Well, that's Matthew 13 happening right then and there. Deception. Right now, Satan, I have no doubt, Satan is deceiving people within the church that are not of the church. He's going around right now and he's using any tool he can find, anything, anybody, any way, to get to you, to get to me, to test or try every doorknob. Doorknob meaning, is there a little bit of pornography over here? I'll wiggle in there. Is there a little bit of lust over here for things, idolatry, money, stuff, cars, that's not under the authority of Jesus? I'm gonna get in here. Is it, is it the, whatever it might be, whatever it might be. He wiggle, he finds something and he starts to wiggle in. Here's what happens. When he attacks the believer, I gotta tell you, Jill, one of the most effective satanic attacks on my life, and thank God there, I can count them on one hand, they were so cunning and so crafty that I didn't realize it was an attack until I was like three days into this thing. And I looked around and it's like, wait a minute. That guy said he was a total born again believer and so did that guy. And this is the thing that's going on and that's the deal? 
How come I didn't see that in the beginning? Wow, so cunning, so crafty. But thank God most of the time, you, you, you know, the hair on your spiritual neck stands up and you realize, wait a minute, something's wrong here. You'll only know that by the word of God, people today, let's be honest, this is not gonna go over well, okay? I'm just gonna warn everybody right now. If you spend more time on Facebook than you do in your Bible, you're, you're a setup for deception. If you spend more time reading the newspaper than you do the Bible, you're, you're set up. If you spend more time watching Netflix than you do the Bible, you're being set up. You're just being set up. Because Satan, listen, he's fine with all that. As long as you are spiritually growing anemic, spiritually growing, I should say spiritually degressing, you're becoming anemic with all the allurements around. Now things hit and a thought is launched into your head. You're going to choose to obey your emotions and the news or that person instead of the Bible. This is the day we're in. This is what's happening right now. I'm watching it happen with pastors I'm watching it happen with Christians. We're watching it happen with churches. It's happening right now. So Jill, you need to be or stay in the Bible, Jill, more than ever. And listen, when somebody says, Jill, what about you? Uh, uh, Scrambled or pulched? Scrambled or fried? Say to them, hang on a minute. I'm a Christian. Let Let me find out. I'll get back to you. There's no rush you can get back to them. What does God say? Not what the Pope says, not what Jack says, not what, not what, no, no, Bible. Jill, stay in the Bible, get your answer from the Bible, and look, you're not gonna be popular, uh, but you're gonna be right. And so that's what I would encourage. Deception's everywhere, and it's increasing fast, for sure. So Summer is in Texas. Um, Summer, are you there? Hi, Summer, this is Jack. Hello, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm very good. What's your question today? So, well, first of all, so you dedicated me when I was two weeks old, when the church was still in the warehouse, and I'm 18 now. Oh, my goodness. I feel very old right now. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) So, yeah, you, so you were in the warehouse building. Yep. My goodness. <laughs> you don't remember it, but yeah. <laughs> wow, I'm honored to hear that. That is so great to hear, Summer. So listen, when, when did you move to Texas? Uh, we moved here about 15 years ago. Oh, wow, okay. Wow. Okay, very good. Well, Summer, uh, what's your question? And I'm honored, by the way, to have been able to dedicate you. That's, that's a great thing to hear. <laughs> So in Revelations, it says that certain believers will stay behind after the rapture to document the tribulation and the return of Jesus and be observers to it. So I would like to know, how are they chosen, and what are the odds that it's going to be me? Okay, let me ask you, Summer, where did you hear that? Show me exactly what you're talking about, where some believers go and some believers don't go. Where, where do you see that? Well, I just read in... I don't remember when, I'll have to look up the verse, but just in Revelations, it said that some would stay behind and be observers to the return of Christ. Um, not exactly. Um, the, the only thing that I can tell you, the book of Revelation, by the way, remember, chapter one reveals who Jesus Christ is. Chapter one, okay? Mm-hmm. Chapter two and three is... Jesus speaking to the seven letters to the seven churches, and maybe that's what you're kind of talking about, where in, to the letter, and go read the letter to the church at Philadelphia, for example. Jesus' letter to the church at Philadelphia, in, that's Philadelphia, Turkey today, in Turkey, not, mm-hmm. not Pennsylvania, Turkey. Um, so Jesus writes, and he tells them that because you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name, I will keep you from the hour that's gonna come upon the entire world to try those who live on the earth. 
That is a promise that the, that the church, not, not just the Philadelphia church, but the, the church of every true believer. So right now, Summer, if Jesus came back tonight for the church, every born again mm-hmm. believer would go up. Everyone who's born again, whoever has the Holy Spirit living in them, go up tonight. That happens. So God doesn't okay. leave. There's nowhere in scripture where it says that he leaves part of his church behind. What he does say in the seven letters to the seven churches, and maybe this is what you're thinking about. He does say to one of the churches, if you don't repent, I'm gonna throw you into great tribulation. That's true. He's talking to people who are in the church, but they're not believers. They're, very, they're religious, but they're not born again. In fact, the, La- the church at Laodicea, the, uh, and I may, I, when you read the seven letters of the seven churches, the last one, Summer, is the church at Laodicea, and it's an unsaved church. Jesus isn't even in it. He's trying to get into it, but they call themselves a church, and they don't even belong to him. Is that crazy? It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. So here's what you want to remember. If you're a born-again believer, that means, Summer, if you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins that you can't, Summer cannot save herself. You cannot, you cannot be good enough, Summer. You can't, you can't give enough money. You can't give enough time. You can't give enough service. There's nothing that Summer or Jack can do to save ourselves because it's impossible. If you believe, Summer, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again from the dead, that Jesus lives and that the Bible, that it's true, that what the Bible says about Jesus is true, then Summer, when the rapture happens, you're going up with me and any other believer that's living at that time. You will go up because the Holy Spirit in you has to present you to Jesus when Jesus comes in the atmosphere. Are you familiar with 1 Thessalonians 4? Mm, Can't say I am. Okay, I want you to read that when we hang up. Read 1 Thessalonians 4, okay? And read John, okay. read John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. And I want you to put those two together and read them, okay? If, okay. If you're looking for Jesus, if you trust Jesus, you're going up. You will not be left behind, okay? That's very clear. Okay. Okay, so hopefully I'll see you well, soon. thank you. Okay, bye-bye, Summer. Yes. Uh, bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Cindy, Cindy and Covina. Cindy, are you there? Hi, Pastor Jack. Hi, how are you? Doing wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking my question. I'll go ahead and just get right to it. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, um, what will happen to the people that heard the gospel, oh. uh, maybe even grew up in the church, they heard about the rapture, they know about the Lord, but they just never surrendered their lives to the Lord Jesus before the rapture? Yeah. Will they have an opportunity um, during the tribulation, or are they lost forever? What, what, can those people become tribulation saints, or yeah. would the tribulation saints be people that never heard the gospel before? Yeah, great question, Cindy. I have to, I have to give you this disclaimer, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you an answer that um, is just kind of uniquely my answer. I'm going to confess that right now. I hope I'm wrong. I'm not joking. I really hope I'm wrong about the answer that I have to that question. But let's just do it together. If you have a Bible there, that will be great. If not, we'll read it, or um, I'll read it for you. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and here's the deal. Some pastors will teach you and say to you, yep, you can evangelize to somebody all you want. If they don't accept Christ, don't worry. Because after the rapture happens, they'll probably wake up and believe you finally, and they'll realize that you weren't goofing around, and then they'll believe. A lot of people say that. I hope that's true. Um, It's kind of weird, though. If it's true, then why evangelize at all? I mean, why make the big deal about it if uh, everybody gets a second chance after the rapture? Is there more to it than that? Well, if you look at 2 Thessalonians 2, that's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says there, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or in trouble, either by spirit, word, or letter, as if 
from us as though the day of Christ had already come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, that would be Jerusalem, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may do so until he's taken out of the way. Okay? And then he goes on to say that uh, the deception uh, is going to come because of the one, the Antichrist, that is going uh, to be revealed. So watch this. You've got, you've got the rapture. People are waiting. The church goes up. And then 2 Thessalonians 2 Verse 10 begins to tell you that the, the Antichrist is revealed. Watch what happens. And with all unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. Why? Why are they perishing? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them Notice, God sends it to them. What's their judgment? They had a chance to believe. They didn't believe. It says here, verse 11, for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. It's not a lie. It's a specific lie that's coming. It's not here yet. It's coming. And it clearly, according to the Bible, it's a lie that comes after the rapture. It says in verse 12 that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So I've got to tell you, my view is this, and it's rare, and I hope I'm wrong. But if I take the word as I see it, there are those walking around today, right now, Cindy, that they know the Bible, they've heard the gospel, they haven't been able to refute it, but they don't believe it. They might even go to church, but it hasn't changed their life. There's, they may be, listen, listen they, they may be believers, but they're not followers of Jesus. And then the rapture happens, and they don't go up. They know the gospel, but they didn't love the gospel enough to believe it. That's exactly who this is speaking to, I believe. So when they say, or when they, you would think that they would say, oh my goodness, I was wrong. I'm gonna believe it now. I'm gonna believe it now. I don't think so. It seems to me that God will judge them with delusion because they didn't believe the love of the truth when they had a chance. So I know that's a terrifying view. I do not like it. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but uh, I struggle uh, because to me it's crystal clear. I just don't like what it says, <laughs> to be honest with you, Cindy. So all the more reason we need to tell everybody we know about Jesus. But Cindy, please remember this. You and I are supposed to tell people. We can't change people. We can't make them believe. We can only give them the word. And that's all we're called to do. And their decision is their decision. And they'll have to answer to God for that decision. So, yeah, it's a strong, I know it's a strong answer to a deep question you asked, so... God bless you, Cindy. Uh, Jared is calling from Lake Tahoe. Beautiful, beautiful Lake Tahoe, California is absolutely spectacular, especially I would think on a day like this. So Jared, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good. Yeah, and thank you for doing this. Thanks for calling or else I wouldn't be doing this. So keep it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what uh, what um, question do you have? So anyway, my question um, is in regards to Revelation 17, 18, 9, 19, when it talks about the mystery Babylon or the great whore of Babylon, and it talks about the city and all her idolatries and all her luxuries and ultimately her doom, mm -hmm. where it says, whoa, great city, you <clears throat> mighty city of Babylon in one hour your doom has come, and then it talks about all the merchants of the earth mourning over her and the loss of their ability to trade their cargoes mm -hmm. and all their luxury items. So I guess just I was wondering if you had any insight into what those particular verses are talking about, especially when you look at today's 
nations and different political entities and or if it's all just speculation. Yeah. Um, okay, first of all, before we go any further, I want to commend to you a tremendous, exhaustive work that you're going to want to have. And that, that book is called um, The Prophecy Knowledge Handbook. The Prophecy Knowledge Handbook by Dr. John... Okay, okay. By, yeah, by Dr. John Wolverid. W O. Uh, o, L, Wol. I'm losing my mind now. W O O L V R D. Wolverid. It's a. It's Dutch. His last name. John Wolverid. The Prophecy Knowledge Handbook. Um, you're going to want to get it because it's going to go into this very deep and very very beautifully with scripture answering scripture. But let's let's just cover this quickly right now. If you look carefully, Jared, Revelation chapter 17 starts out with what is referred to. In fact, if you look at the first, um, well, if you look at the entire chapter, actually, but specifically the first seven verses, it deals with a religious aspect of what is Babylon. And that's, a, that's an awesome thing. And I got to tell you, I did a study on this. I, 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 it's a pretty, in, pretty exhaustive study. You can get it at our, at our, at our jackhibbs.com or something you can click on. But um, it's called the road to Babylon. But why is that important to study? Because listen, there's spiritual Babylon and Jesus says it's spiritual. Book of Revelation says that spiritual Babylon was where our Lord Jesus was crucified. Wow, it causes, it calls unbelieving Jerusalem spiritual Babylon. But we also know this, that Babylon literally existed. It was a real massive global empire and it reached its zenith under, of course, its greatest leader of all time and that would have been Nebuchadnezzar. So it's an actual geographical place and it's situated there off the Euphrates River. But right now it's like no man's land. It's like barren. So what's going to happen? Well, number one, Revelation 17 when you read it, it deals with the spiritual nature of Babylon. All the false cults from the beginning of ancient Babylon. All the false religions, pagan worship systems, idolatry. Uh, all of these things are wrapped up in what is referred to in Revelation 17 of the spiritual side of this Babylon. But if you keep reading... You get to Revelation chapter 18, and Revelation chapter 18 starts to deal with its economic impact, its economic control. So there's a spirit that answers to Babylon, the spiritual antiquity or history. Then there's the commercial Babylon. And when you read it, to, let's be honest, if you read it, it sounds like you're reading about New York City or something. I mean, it sounds like something like in America. But when you read it, it's definitely telling us that in the, in the future, I believe that way after the church is gone, I believe this is after the rapture, part of the Antichrist efforts to swoon the world will be the fact that he actually is going to rebuild the ancient area of Babylon. It's going to happen very quick. I think he's going to do it. And because he is who he is, it appears that he has... I, okay, I speculate right now, Jared, but just write this down and check and see. It seems to me that the Antichrist, when I read the entire Bible, it seems to me that he's going to have a stronghold in Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18. It seems to me that he's going to have a stronghold, or how can I say, an office? <laughs> He'll have a headquarters in Babylon. I think he has a headquarters in Jerusalem. And if I understand uh, Bible prophecy, right? He has an office in Rome. It seems as though he has three geographical locations that he operates on, on, on the earth. I think Revelation 17 and 18 is spiritual and commercial Babylon, and they are intertwined spirit, but also physical manifestation. I think the Antichrist is going to build that economic machine uh, during his seven-year uh, period of his deception. And so check it out. It's one reporter's opinion, but get that book, 
by the excellent Dr. John Wolverd, if you would. Um, we need to hurry. I can't believe, are we coming up on an, an hour and a half, guys? I can't believe this. So uh, this is Mike from Fresno. Um, Mike, Mike, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yes, I can hear you. Great. What, okay. What's your question, Mike? Okay. Um, so me and my wife both had this question. What is your advice in engaging in today's culture while holding on to Titus 3.9? It feels we cannot fully disengage when we are being threatened by evil laws as a result. And another one. Uh, also, who gets sent to the new earth? And one more for me, sorry. Is there going to be water in heaven? Because I like surfing. <laughs> um, okay, first of all, did you say, did you say Titus uh, 3, what did you say? Titus 3 what? Ti Titus 3, 9. Titus 3, 9. Okay, hang on. I'm sorry, my fingers are so dry. It's very dry outside and I need, I need help on my hands. Okay, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and useless. Okay, well, first of all, great question, but first of all, Titus 3, that, that's dealing with uh, false teachings, false doctrines, false prophets, uh, uh, staying clear of deception. Uh, but that verse nine, I, actually, it's kind of cool how you've thought about that in a political sense because uh, the political realm <laughs> is most often senseless, crazy, and, and, and like that. Uh, but here's the thing. When, when it comes to silly, foolish conversations and debates that have no answer, no conclusion, leave them alone. Just leave those things alone. But when it comes to something, for example, you brought it up right, when it comes to something, how do we engage politics as a believer? Number one, why should we? Number two, what can we do? Well, number one, as a believer, you're the only one on the planet that knows how to think right about his culture. Think of that. If you have this book in your life, you have the wisdom of God. You know as a believer what should go on in your school system. You know what should go on with your taxes. You know, you see, Jack, well, why would I care? Ah, because, Mike, you are a, a believer who has been allowed to be born in America. You live in the United States of America. And by the way, the same logic applies to our friends in Canada or in Argentina. Wherever God placed you, you are to be a light to that nation for righteousness, it doesn't mean we quit and throw our hands up and say, this world's nuts, I'm not gonna go outside. No, we go out and do the right thing. For example, we shine our light in the school board, we shine our light in our culture, we shine our light everywhere because Jesus told us to do that. But the important thing is that you keep in mind that the world that you and I live in, it needs our witness. We need to shine forth the righteousness of God everywhere. And you have been given, Mike, you and your wife, myself and my wife, Lisa, as well, every believer, we've been given the responsibility to do righteousness for the state of California. If we don't, evil will take over completely. We're supposed to take a stand against child molesters. We're supposed to take a stand against bank robbers. We're supposed to take a stand against injustice. We're so, who's going to do this if we don't? That's very important. Now, the other thing is um, about, you talked about the millennium. About, I think you said, right, Mike, about who lives in, who goes into the millennium? Yes, into the new earth. Yeah. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is going to judge the nations at his second coming. Those human beings that survived through all of the horrific events of the earth, they're gonna be judged in Jerusalem. They're gonna make their way to Jerusalem, the Bible tells us, and Jesus is gonna separate them like a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He's gonna separate the nations, just like a shepherd removes goats from the sheep. Those nations, those people, those, those uh, Gentiles, who during the tribulation period, notice the criteria in Matthew 25, they 
were good to Israel. They were good to a Jew. They comforted a Jew during the tribulation period. That's the criteria. Remember, Mike, Jesus said, as much as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. He's talking about his Jewish brethren. He's not talking about the church. Matthew 25. Those who treated Israel kindly during the tribulation period, they live into the millennium. They get to inherit the millennium. And the millennium is going to be restored. It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome. And you said you liked surfing. Well, I know this, that <laughs> yeah. there's, there's definitely water in the millennium. And for that matter, there's, there's water in eternity. Because after the millennium, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, there's water. But the Bible does tell us that in the new creation, there's no ocean. I don't know why. Look, I love the ocean. I love, I love the sea. <laughs> As, like you do. I love it. I just, it's in my blood. So when I first read that in the Bible, I was very disappointed and I didn't want to go there. <laughs> but I, I promise you, whatever God has for us, uh, it's going to be somehow, without an ocean, you are somehow probably going to enjoy some form of surfing, even if it's on a cloud. I don't know how it's going to happen. <laughs> Heaven is absolutely going to be I don't think you and I will be in heaven, Mike, and we're going to say, oh, man, this place would be great if we just had a beach. I, we, will, <laughs> we will not be disappointed. I don't know what's coming, but it's going to be amazing. Somehow for you and I, brother, God's going to give us a really cool experience that will be uh, better than surfing. So, Amen. God bless you, brother. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sarah from West Covina. Sarah, are you there from West Covina? Yes. Hi, Pastor Jack. Hi, Sarah. What's your question today? I, my question is, um, how do we lovingly respond to our brothers and sisters who say that uh, Christians should not get involved in politics, particularly those that blame, um, that say that John the Baptist found himself in hot water because he um, got involved in politics? <laughs> that's that's well John the Baptist got in, got himself involved in politics wasn't even in his mind John the Baptist rebuked <laughs> that's a great I love your question uh, John the Baptist rebuked a politician uh, and do you remember why John the Baptist rebuked a politician who was conducting himself in a lewd manner regarding uh Solmain and her and his and her daughter's dance. Uh, so listen, um, forget if somebody tells you you know John the Baptist got involved in politics and he got his head cut off. That's that's not what happened. John the Baptist got his head cut off because he called somebody uh, who was in power a hypocrite, and so John got John got his yes. head cut off. Okay, so but here's the deal. Let me ask you, allow me, allow me, Sarah, just to, um, to play something out with you, okay? So you're going to be my guinea pig okay. for a second. Um, okay, so, so Jack and Sarah were Christians, and we know that God wants us, according to the Bible, God wants us to live a quiet and peaceable life. He wants us to live a quiet and peaceable life, it says. He wants us to live a life that is productive. He wants us to live a life that... Um, that we not only make money, but we actually give money to people because that's, that's how tithing works. And he told us that we need to help other people. So we have our jobs. And um, Jesus even alluded to the fact that uh, people have homes, that a man came and knocked on the door of someone's house in the middle of the night and the man wanted bread. And so we got all this stuff going on. And then we have, so then we have a, a system like we do in America. And we have an elected, a representative form of government. That's how you and I live, Sarah. We have mayors, we have city council, we have uh, county personnel, we have governors and presidents and all that stuff, okay? So that's the system you and I okay. live in. God gave us this system. Okay, so do you, agree, do, you, yes. do you agree with me as a believer that God gave us our government? A hundred percent. Yeah, and he's given, let's be honest, he's given governments to every nation on earth. Good, bad, or ugly, they're the governments that God has given. We, you, you and I are blessed because yes. he gave us a good one. So here's the deal. 
So if, if candidate, if politician A is, is known to be a liar, he's been caught in lies, and he's got a pretty shady past, and he wants to make sure that Sarah and Jack, they give tax money to abort babies, so vote for this guy, versus candidate number, or candidate B. Uh, politician B is a guy that's a, or a woman, let's just pick, the other guy was a guy, so let's pick, let's have a woman. So she, she is, um, she has a husband and kids, she's got her own business, she's, she's a woman of integrity, she's pro-life, um, and she, uh, she states her case. And you look at them, Sarah, you look at them. Now, God's giving you the abil- ability to choose one or the other, right? In this republic. He's giving right. you... The- so God's, mm-hmm. God says, I want you to use every opportunity to shine the light for, for me, to represent me everywhere. So Sarah, I'm going to ask you a question. Here it comes. If Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let me ask you this question. Sarah, where are you not supposed to shine your light? Yeah, I, I can't think of any, anything. The reason why you can't is because there yeah. isn't any place. Jesus, when he told you to shine yeah. your light, he said in front of everybody. So, so you, have, you have one candidate that may or may not believe in God, but their actions prove that they, are, they don't value life. You've got another candidate that may or may not believe in God, but they're, they're for life. They're, for, they're pro-life, okay? So your Bible tells you, mm-hmm. Sarah, that Jack and Sarah, we are supposed to stand for babies or children. Proverbs tells us, Proverbs, I think it's 29, Proverbs chapter 29, I think that we are to speak up for those who have no voice, those who have been silenced, those who, are de- who have been decreed to die. It's a tremendous description of an unborn child. If you and I don't stand up and vote for the candidate that's for life, how are we shining our light if we stay home, for example, on election day? We say, I'm not gonna get involved. Well, you have an opportunity to vote for that lady yeah. who's pro-life. No, I'm not going to get involved. Yeah. But you have a chance to change the law by voting for her. Choose life, God said. Choose, choose today whom you'll serve. That person's going to get elected and they're going to make the decisions for your children and your children's children. So who are you going to vote for, you know? Yeah. Amen. Think yeah. about it. Think yeah. about it. It's like, oh my Amen. gosh, all of a sudden, now I want to be involved in PTA, school board, right? Congressman, senator, governor, president. Why? Because they're going to make decisions with my money, with my freedom, and they're going to make decisions that are going to affect my kids and my grandkids. And God didn't, thank God, he did not give us a... A, a, a dictatorial government. Thank God that you and I live here where we still get to pick those who are most representative in their decision-making that honors God. It's amazing. That's why you should be involved. Thanks for watching the Real Life YouTube channel. We love bringing you content that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss one single video or live stream and you can share it with friends and family. If you'd like to support this ministry by helping us reach others, by taking the gospel and the teaching around the world, you can do so by clicking the Give Now button. So thanks again for watching and God bless.